Welcome to our webinar on antibiotic use in uh, food animals and human health concerns. I'm joined today by Dr. Bob Strong. He's our industry expert and um, trainer with SI Global, and he's um, really kind of the driving force between a number of different food uh, safety opportunities and operations in our business. He's a one of our um, trainers, uh, consultant. He does a plethora of things for us. He's a wealth of information. So I welcome you, Dr. Bob. I'll kick off, if you don't mind, just going back one there uh, with a bit of a disclaimer so folks on the call understand kind of where we are intending with this content. So our intent is, of course, to inform, um, but it is not our intention for SI Global or Dr. Bob to make a statement or offer an opinion on the use of antibiotics in the meat industry um, and the purposes of their use. So we invite everyone who listens or watches this webinar to form your own opinion as to the validity of the cited um, data sources that we've referenced. Um, and uh, there's a number of them given, and so you're free, free, feel free to accept or challenge that data and discuss with others. That's really the intention of this, is to create conversation. So again, we'll uh, send a copy of the slides as well as a recording and lots of different sources referenced in here. So we'll invite you to uh, review those um, as you see fit. So with that, Dr. Bob, I will kick over to you. Thanks, Holly, and uh, welcome to everybody who has taken the time out of their busy days to listen to this informative uh, session on antibiotic use in food animals. We're going to talk about the history of antibiotic use. We're going to talk about past legislative recommendations and then bring it up to date with current regulatory uh, information. We're going to talk about links to antibiotic resistant bacteria, and we're going to talk about how the food industry in general is responding to consumer requirements. But at no time am I going to be citing anything other than is publicly available and information. If you do not believe it is credible or valid, then we suggest that you take it up with the authors because this is their opinion. And in some cases, we are gonna be quoting the government, in other cases, we are gonna be quoting interest groups. So moving on to the next slide. So Dr. Bob, of... yeah, let me jump yeah. in. Here. This is the poll question I alluded to. So let me launch it here. We'll read the responses, give you about a minute. So are you concerned as a consumer, are you concerned about antibiotic use in, the, uh, in food animals? So perhaps your response is, um, I avoid meat because of my concerns, you just stay away. Perhaps you're one that studies labels and only buys non-antibiotic uh, products. Perhaps you shop at stores that claim um, no antibiotic use, uh, you go, so you go based on the brand or the retailer. Um, perhaps you're just really selective, it's case by case, or perhaps you're not concerned at all at this point. I imagine Dr. Bob will get quite a varied response. There's lots of discussion out there, but um, equally so, folks that really aren't concerned. So there's, um, it's really sort of starts just starting to grow, I think. Well, yeah, I think there are people who are not concerned, and maybe it's because they don't know uh, any, they don't have any opinion because they don't know anything. There are some people who do have an opinion and are not concerned, and so I'm expecting to maybe get a little bit of a spread across all of these. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Let me close and share. So 10%, I avoid meat because of my concerns. 17%, I study labels and only buy non-antibiotic. 20%, I'm selective uh, where I eat out. 3%, I only shop at stores that claim no antibiotic use. And 50%, I'm not concerned. So very even spread. Um, lots of different um, opinions um, and thoughts on there. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. And Holly, you'll have to kind of do it for me, it's not working. Anyway, let's talk about the history of antibiotic use. When were antibiotics discovered? They were discovered back in 1928, and thank goodness to them, we actually in the Second World War were able to treat people that we weren't able to treat before because of antibiotics and save people losing limbs that were infected. But in 1950s, farmers discovered actually that a small amount of antibiotics fed to their animals could allow them to grow quicker, bigger, and quicker. And so therefore, what started was antibiotic use in animals was starting to be used for many things, not just obviously to treat sick animals. And we'll talk about that in a minute. 
The concern became that as the antibiotics kill the non-resistant bacteria, that would leave the resistant bacteria and the resistant bacteria then was free to multiply and didn't have to compete with the non-resistant bacteria. Next slide. So what we're gonna be quoting is many different sources now. This one is from CDC, and therefore we've given you the reference below and you can go to it and look at the challenges the CDC has put out with regard to antibiotic resistance and the fact that it's being used in animals and therefore it results in some bacteria becoming antibiotic resistant. And then they talk about the fact that this thing can show up in your table when you're eating things and therefore it can become a problem for, for the consumer if you are of certain groups. And we'll talk about that in the next few slides. So which type of antibiotics tended to get used in the farms and where were they being used? Well, it tended to be penicillin, tetracycline, and bacitracin, which are also ones used quite often to treat public or uh, human problems. And it's mainly used in poultry and beef cattle and to a lesser extent in swine, so therefore in pigs. I think we went two slides then, okay. So USDA, and again, I'm quoting the USDA here, the USDA in 2015 talked about how antibiotics are used in livestock production. And they found out that the farmers were using them for four different reasons. They were using them to treat animals that were sick. They were treating them to prevent healthy animals getting sick when they were around diseased animals, and that's called metaphylactic use. They were using them to try to prevent animals getting sick in the first place, so therefore there's prophylactic uses. And they were also using the antibiotics to promote faster or more efficient livestock growth. And therefore for production purposes, antibiotics are generally administered through medicated feed and may coincidentally prevent disease. The Sustainable Food Trust, which we quote here, did a survey and found out that 80% of all antibiotics produced in the US are used in meat production, which may surprise you, 80%. US uses more antibiotics per pound of meat than any other country in the world. And we have no mandatory restrictions. Antibiotic free label claims, the Sustainable Food Trust found, were not always what they said. So therefore people were claiming it, but the proof was that they weren't claiming what they actually were able to prove. So what are the consumer concerns? So a group called Food Revolution decided to do a survey of consumer concerns, which we just did, and we found out that 50% of people weren't concerned. But when they did the survey, they found out that people were generally in agreement that using antibiotics for sick animals is humane and needs to be done and we shouldn't just let an animal suffer or just slaughter an animal, animal because they're sick. Where they had a problem though was using antibiotics to protect animals from adjacent sick animals instead of quarantine those sick animals away from the healthy animals which obviously we do sometimes with humans, we move them away from healthy humans so they don't contaminate other healthy humans. The next concern they had was that there was a use of antibiotics to promote faster growth. Their biggest concern was this has led to antibiotic resistant bacteria is what the public believes. And we'll talk about some studies that say that's true, but again, there are some who say that the link is not there. Next slide. So I talk a little about antimicrobials versus antibiotics because some people obviously confuse these two. 
An antimicrobial includes all drugs that work against a variety of microorganisms, such as bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. Antibiotics, on the other hand, are effective against bacteria only. But they're also antimicrobials. But not all antimicrobials are antibiotics. Antimicrobial resistance is when the bacteria or the microbes become resistant to the effects of the drug after being exposed to it. This means the drug and similar drugs will no longer be effective against the, these microbes. And that was what the biggest concern from the public who had a concern was that we were developing the potential, or maybe we have already developed, antibiotic resistant bacteria. So we say that well, where's the regulators on this? And what's their type of oversight in the use of antibiotics on farms? So let's go back to 1977. And remember, antibiotics were discovered in 1928. It was 1950 when farmers found that use of them could allow them to have the animals grow quicker and to larger sizes. Well, by 1977, the FDA decided to recommend, but not mandate, that we should start diminishing or discontinuing the usage of antibiotics to have animals grow quicker. It probably had very little effect, if you can see the numbers here, because between 1999 and 2011, the use of antibiotics rose from 18 million pounds to 30 million pounds. And that's in America. So therefore, it was getting used more and more and more by farmers, whether they were raising cattle or raising chickens, in order to get those animals heavier and to market quicker. So in 2011, a group called the National Resources Defense Council sued the FDA. So a couple of years later, after the FDA decided in 2013 they would revoke the 1977 guidelines and ask the industry to voluntarily restrict usage. By 2015, we estimated that 80% of all livestock was being given antibiotics for non-health reasons. So it didn't again appear like anybody was getting to do it voluntarily nor were they concerned in the industry about it. So the FDA in 2015 said, okay, we'll make a, another recommendation. But well, this time we'll make a recommendation to the people who make the antibiotics. But it's going to be voluntary. We're not going to make them do it. We're going to ask the antibiotic industry, the pharmaceutical industry, to change their labels. And when they change their labels, we would say that they're not supposed to be used for the growth of animals. So the new FDA guidelines that came out just basically a year ago said when product labeling is voluntary changed, so remember it's voluntary changed by the pharmaceutical industry, it will be a violation of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to use these products in feed for production purposes. In other words, to promote growth and not just use them for health reasons. But if the industry doesn't change the labels, then the FDA is not going to be able to react because currently the label does not say that and the label is under the control of the pharmaceutical industry and the FDA has asked them voluntarily to change it. Because if they change it, then the FDA regulations on extra label use, that means using something for purposes not stated on the label, would not permit drugs to be used for production purposes, whether administered through feed or, other, feed or otherwise, since the regulations do not permit extra label use for non-therapeutic purposes. So therefore, where we're going here is, if the pharmaceutical industry would change the labels, then it would basically say these antibiotics can't be used for animals except to treat sick animals. And if they were used to treat animals that weren't sick, that would be a non-allowed use. I could use the word maybe illegal use. Now you say to yourself, well, where's the rest of the world? Well, I'm not quite sure where the rest of the world is, but the European Union banned the use of antibiotics to stimulate growth in food in animals in 2006. 
So 13 years ago, they decided it wasn't a good practice. And if you want to see where this is source of this is coming from, this is coming from the FDA website. And so the FDA's, and we've quoted the USDA, and we've quoted several interest groups, and we're going to quote some more now as we try to inform you of where everything is without forming an opinion ourselves. So you say to yourself, who else is involved in this? Well, the USDA chief scientist made a statement to the World Health Organization, who has some concerns. And this is a statement made in November of 2017. USDA agrees, this is the USDA chief, saying that we need more data to assess progress on antimicrobial use and resistance. And we need to continue to develop alternative therapies for the treatment, control, and prevention of disease in animals. We remain committed to addressing antimicrobial resistance in people and animals. We will continue to work with the World Health, Org Health Organization to promote antibiotic stewardship, therefore responsible use, to avoid the further emergence and spread of antibiotic resistance. And that again was a press release put out in 2017 by the USDA on the subject matter. And remember USDA is in charge of meat and poultry. So you say, well, how could the use of antibiotics in livestock translate into possibly affecting human health? Well, you could have antibiotic residues in meat products. And there is some link of residues causing allergic reactions and digestive problems in certain humans. So the FDA, recognizing this, has established minimum intervals between the last dosage of antibiotics and the time of slaughter to prevent such residues. And they will take action against farmers to send their cattle to market with the drug residues in the animal. Well, obviously, we weren't doing that very well in the past because we weren't finding too much meat out there because we weren't looking. The FDA is now looking, and they are finding it, and they are going back to the farmer. So we are, but they're not looking at all the meat. They don't, don't have the resources to look at all the meat. So that's not going to be the way that you're going to be checking. The promotion of the development of drug resistant bacteria. Using animals, this may yield adverse human health effects if people come in contact with the drug resistant bacteria, either through their food, for the fact that they actually work with these live farm animals, they're exposed to the animal manure, or they're, or they're exposed to feathers because they work in chicken houses, or they're working with infected producers, or they're in a processing facility where these animals come in to be slaughtered. And therefore, they're, they're finding that it is actually things that you can get by being around these animals, whether you're at a farm, whether you're in a slaughterhouse, whether you're at a fabricating facility, Usually the fabricating facility is also the slaughterhouse, but we're also finding it showing up in hospitals and healthcare facilities. And therefore infected people can then transmit the drug resistant illness to others. And you say, well, where's all this information coming from? This is in CDC. So if you want to go and look at the CDC website that we've quoted there, CDC is continuing to be concerned about the use of antibiotics in livestock and the development of antibiotic resistant bacteria. So you say, well, how does the industry sometimes try to find the antibiotics in the food so that therefore we can stop it at an early stage and it won't make it through the supply chain and finish up in restaurants, in retailers, and on your kitchen table? Well, dairies test the milk upon arrival from farms. Now, when I say dairies, it doesn't mean every dairy does it, but most dairies do. They test the milk on the tanker for the for beta lactams for antibiotics because they can't process them out of the milk. So if it's in the milk, they can't accept the milk. And particularly if they're making culture products, the chances are it may have a bad effect. And the system right now is set up when they test it and they find it, they refuse the tanker, they report it to the state. The state then finds the driver, finds out where he picked up the milk from test the samples you got from the different farms and they find out which farmer sent his milk to the markets with the antibiotics in it. Now you say, well, why was he using the antibiotics? Well, the cow got mastitis. 
and therefore you can't send the milk to the market when you're putting antibiotics in the animal to cure the cow's mastitis. But you're throwing away the milk. So therefore there's a tendency, if you want to be a little unscrupulous, to try to send your milk to the market before the antibiotics are out of it. Well, they get caught, and the dairy industry has been rather strict on this, but not everybody tests it. And so I'm not telling you that and you could go and be sure that every milk, but I would say you can be pretty reasonably sure. The FDA has begun testing retail meat products, but it is random. The USDA does not require testing of meat or slaughter handlands. So there is no testing when an animal comes in and you slaughter it to test a sample of the meat to see if there's antibiotics in it. And where would you do it if you were going to do it? Well, most dairy cattle are sold to make into ground beef. They're not where you get your prime steaks and your ribeyes and all that from. So it would be in that type of industry, if you were to do it, then you would be doing the testing. So again, where's this coming from? This is coming from the CDC site. So you said, well, let, tell me a little bit more about antibiotic resistant bacteria because 50% of us, of the people on the call today, said that they weren't concerned. And obviously it's up to you personally whether you're concerned or not. So I'm not trying to sway your uh, uh, concern. But the most common bacteria that's resistant to antibiotics is something called MRSA, which is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And that actually started off being a hospital acquired infection, but it's now out there in the community and it's now a livestock problem. And in 2011, Translation Genomics Research Institute showed that MRSA in meats and in workers working with meats was increasing. They also had a case where they found antibiotic resistant E. coli was found in workers working with poultry in India. Now you may say, well, these don't seem like that they're widespread, but they are a concern because we are finding that people working with animals are starting to develop antibiotic resistant bacteria in their body. Again, where does this come from? It comes from CDC's information. So now you say, well, okay, so what else could you possibly be controlling it? What else could you do something about it if you want to? Well, you have to talk about the food industry that obviously is using the meat. Because we found out that obviously farming is reluctant to make changes. Because obviously if it enables an animal to grow quicker, to get fatter, to give you more meat, to give you a better return on your money, then obviously you're going to be a little reluctant to make changes. So therefore farming is a little slow in wanting to make any changes if we believe they need to. Retail and food service. When you look at that, some have endorsed non-antibiotic use for growth purposes for years. And they've been some of the forerunners in doing that. Some have joined this movement after they saw the concerns being raised by the public. Some are changing because their competitors are doing it. But there are still some who are not inclined to change at all. And then we see people making claims, and according to information, some of those claims are just that, they're claims. So again, you have to make up your mind, is the claim something that has validity to it? And if it does, what is the proof of that validity? Because the consumer who is a maybe a more discriminating consumer is demanding change. And they're shopping for meats that have not been subjected to antibody use for growth. Remember, they're not against using antibiotics to humanely treat a sick animal. They're against the use of antibiotics just to make the animal grow quicker, get heavier, and get more uh, return on the investment of the farmer. Some of them have gone to the point of going to their favorite retailer or restaurant and saying, I want proof that you actually are doing what you say you're doing and that you're actually having third party auditors go out and do these type of audits, of which obviously you 
the way if we're going to wait for regulators then we've seen that it hasn't basically been very successful because we've seen voluntary guidelines put out in 77 we've seen the fda being sued by a, a group on the outside and changing things in 2013 we've seen them start to change things again and we've seen them say we would like you to do it we want you to do it we want you to be voluntary do it but now they're trying to attack uh, uh, trying to, the approach i mean not the attack approach of going to the pharmaceutical industry and saying help us out by changing your labels because obviously again if the pharmaceutical industry will change the labels it will become illegal to use these antibiotics just to promote growth but let's be realistic if 80 percent of your sales of your antibiotics are in that i'm not sure the pharmaceutical industry is going to have much incentive to want to change their labels unless it's mandated and right now it's just voluntary and so you say how do fast food restaurants fare on this well there is a group and again, we're quoting them. So if somebody wants to question the validity of their data, that's a discussion to have with them. They found out that the commitment to a vision of a better world, a set of core values and strategic approach to getting things done is what that public interest network is, is their motto. And they conducted a survey in 2018 of the top 25 burger restaurants on how they were doing in moving to only serving ground beef from animals that have not been treated with antibiotics. Those are things that are available for you to see. So if you go to that website, you can see how the individual burger restaurants set up against what they're doing voluntarily because nobody is mandating it, whether it be government or whether it be the industry themselves. And what they're saying in that report the overuse of antibiotics in livestock production significantly contributes to the spread of antibiotic disease. And again, I quote what's at the bottom. You may say, well, that's a little a bit of a strong statement. And that's not me making that statement. Notice as SI Global, that is a statement made by this organization. And they say the more antibiotics you use, the more bacteria becomes immune to them. That again, may be something that is reaching a little further than they can actually maybe prove. But they still say that even today, 70% of medically important antibiotics are sold in the US to go to food animals. That means only 30% of it's used for other purposes, like treating sick animals, or I mean sick animals, sick humans, and therefore 70%. So the biggest part of antibiotics is going to, to make animals grow better. So, Holly, I need you to again change the slide. Could you word for me? Sorry, folks, we're having a little bit of a problem getting the next slide up. All right. So, let's talk about some other articles. I want to give you some more information. I've tried to find as many different opinions, as many different resources. So that again, you can take this information and you can use it to form your own opinion, whether you're doing it on behalf of your company, whether you're doing it for personal reasons because of you know, controlling your diet. There was an article put out, uh, and this was put out by sfgate.com, a business article, in which they actually complimented two restaurant chains. And therefore, I'm not promoting these restaurant chains other than to say they did get lauded over the fact that they have established very strong stands on the antibiotic uses. And they've got uh, evidence to back that up. And in fact, Panera has their party audits annually to verify the validity of their chains. And so there are, there is a movement, slow as it is, there is a movement for fast food chains to start adopting new policies to support antibiotic free meat. So what does the future look like? Well, this was something going back in 2016. And this was obviously, this is a statement that was put out by 
that drug resistant vaccines a threat to our economy it was put out by the World Bank in 2016. And it said antimicrobial resistance could increase globally. So by the year 2050, it could increase our healthcare costs. This is healthcare costs for humans by a trillion dollars. Because every time you come up with an antibiotic resistant bacteria, you got to try and find an antibiotic that will work for it. And what they're saying is at that current time, we don't have any. So the bacteria is starting to win and those developing drugs are starting to somewhat lose. Hopefully as humans, we tend to try to win these battles and we usually do, but not always as quickly as we'd like to. This is something that was put out by Dr. Margaret Chan, the World Health Organization Director General. She said, the food industry needs to reduce its massive use, that's her words, its massive use of antibiotics. Consumers should make antibiotic free meat their preferred choice. So what she's promoting is, if consumers would make their statements and stop buying antibiotic treated animals, then obviously they would have a big say in where the industry is gonna go because ultimately who buys your product? Your consumers do. The Netherlands showed that between 2007 and 2015, they actually reduced their use of antibiotics by 60%. Now it is one of the, and now because of that, so they're actually able to document in the Netherlands that they now have the lowest levels of antimicrobial resistance in the world. Again, this is put out by BMJ, so that's the um, Business Management Journal. So again, these are sources you can go look up yourself. So what are the next steps? While well, consumers may pressure senators to write legislation to limit use of antibiotics, because when you think about it, FDA and USDA don't generally set the laws. The laws are set by Congress, and then the FDA and USDA has to go along with what Congress says, and Congress is obviously senators, and senators are the ones that you as a consumer, if you're concerned, need to be lobbying with your senators, that you only want antibiotics to be used for sick animals, and to phase out the use of them to promote growth. So we're not saying here immediately stop it, what they're saying phase out and maybe set a time period at which the use of antibiotics to promote growth starts being reduced 20%, 20%, 20%, and if you want to, maybe over five years. Consumer opinion, you may want to start lobbying the pharmaceutical industry to change their labels, because once they change their labels on how antibiotics can be used, they cannot be used for other purposes because that's a violation of the law. And the FDA is involved in labeling where the USDA is obviously involved in raising animals and slaughtering and fabricating animals. If you feel that, that those two won't work because it's hard to get sometimes to get senators to vote on things and particularly if they don't believe that it's in the national interest and if the pharmaceutical industry is not going to be persuaded to change their labels because 80% of their sales are what we're telling them not to sell to, then you may want to petition your favorite restaurant chain and say to them, hey, if you want me to keep coming in, want me to keep eating your products, then I want you to be buying only from beef and chicken suppliers who administer antibiotics only when an animal is sick and under the direct supervision of a vet. Now you say, well, what does that last part mean? You cannot just do it by adding it to medicated feeds and do it that way. You would only be able to do it by having a vet come over and treat a sick animal by using some type of oral or some type of injection. And therefore it would only be for that particular animal and it wouldn't be put in the feed because you don't want to feed it to all your animals when you only got one sick animal. So that's what that's talking about. You only do when the animal is sick and under the direct supervision of a vet. And quite often the vet is somebody who by professional status is not going to do things that are illegal. 
We hope this presentation brought you a whole lot of data, brought you a whole lot of information, brought you a lot of uh, sites to go to in order for those of you who were concerned. And out of the group we had online, 50% of them were not. But for the other 50% of you, if you want to be able to look up the references, we will be giving you a copy of all these slides. As Holly said, they'll be sent out in a couple of days to everybody who signed up to listen to this webinar. I thank you for listening and look forward to talking to you at our next webinar in a couple of weeks.